27 on page 236, page 236. Psalm 27, and we're going to read verses 1. We're going to sing verses 1 to the end of the double verse marked 4. The Lord's my light and saving health. Who shall make me dismayed? My life strength is the Lord. Of whom then shall I be afraid? Psalm 27, from the beginning to the end of the double verse marked 4. Let us stand to sing to God's praise. heads as we call on God's name in prayer. We're going to close our eyes, bow our heads, and speak to God. Lord our God, uh, we want to pray today, we want to echo the words that we've just been singing, that I, the beauty of the Lord, behold me and admire. And, And like the psalmist, we want to inquire of you today. We want to ask, what does God say? What does God want me to hear today? And so we thank you that we have the book from which you speak. We have the Bible available to us. It is your word. So may we recognize this morning as we, as we read it and as we study it, that God still speaks today through this book. We're grateful, Lord, for every individual who's here in church this morning uh, in, a, in, a, in an age where Many people have no time for you or maybe no thought of you. We thank you, Lord, for everyone who does. And so whatever reason brings us here today, whether we're here with excitement or expectancy or whether we're here under duress, Lord, you meant us to be here. And so we pray that in our worship today we would we would sense that God is drawing us to himself, that, is God, that God is speaking to our hearts. So bless us, young and old. Be with the children with us, Lord. We, we love them, and we know that you love them, and we commit them to you, Lord, that your hand would be upon them in their, 
in their early years, these formative years, Lord, that you would bless them and that they would grow up and not depart, Lord, from the, what they have been taught, that they would grow up to follow you. So be with us, Lord. Every one of us, as you see our need, we're, we're a varied group of people and we have lots of different needs, but every single need is known to you. So draw close to us today, we pray. Bless us as we speak to the children just now. And all these things we ask, we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Right, I think you should come down to the front today to see what I've got to show you. I've got quite a lot of bits to show you today. I've hidden some stuff behind here, okay? So, I hope you know who these folk are. This one doesn't. Anyone want to hold that fellow? Because he doesn't really want to stand up. And, and this one here. And this one here. Oh, and this giant fellow here. A very, very long neck. This fellow here. Okay, how many of you like dinosaurs? A few of you. Anybody not come down who likes dinosaurs? Is anybody hiding up there at the back? Yeah, okay. Right, well, I want to tell you some things about dinosaurs because, let me just put this fellow down because he's a, he's a bit of a giant, okay? He's quite big. Sta oh, stand well done. Okay, I couldn't. Do you think he'll still stand if I put him up here? If there's space on the table for all of them. Oh, he will. Okay. But you know, people will tell you that there's no such thing as dinosaurs in the Bible. But I don't think that's right. So I want to read you a verse from the Bible that I think talks to us about dinosaurs. But the first thing you need to remember is that the Bible tells that God made all the animals. Every animal that exists just now and every animal that ever existed before, God made all. All of them. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a list of every animal he made. I mean, the list would be far too long, okay? But even if it did, even if there was a list of every single animal God ever made, it wouldn't say dinosaurs. And do you know why? Because they weren't called dinosaurs when the Bible was written. The word dinosaurs is only about 200 years old. That's when it, that word was made up to describe these creatures. Before that, they were probably called dragons, okay? The word dinosaur, it's not going to be in the Bible because the Bible was written long before the word was invented. But I want to read you a verse that I think describes a dinosaur. It's in the book of Job, and it's in chapter 40, okay? So Job's, it's really, really old, going right back to nearly the beginning of the world, the world. And God says this, to Job, he's speaking. He says, look at the behemoth. Okay, so that's a big name for some animal. Look at the behemoth, which I made along with you, which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength he has in his loins. That's in his legs. His tail sways like a cedar. That's like a tree. He talks about a tail as big as a tree on this animal. And then it says, his, the sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like rods of iron. Super strong. Really, really hard. He is first among the works of God. And yet his maker can approach him with the sword. So that's saying God can God can kill him. This massive animal, which is super scary, God's more powerful than it. Now, some people say that description that I've just read to you, some people say that's an elephant, or maybe it's a hippopotamus, but none of these descriptions really fit, whereas it fits with one of these. It fits with a dinosaur. So I want you to remember that dinosaurs are in the Bible, we think. Okay, it looks like it, sounds like it. They didn't have the name dinosaur. 
That wasn't made up until 200 years ago, but it's there. And then people say, "How but were dinosaurs in the attic? I mean, how could Noah fit them in? They're huge. Well, some of them are huge, but some of them aren't very big at all. The average dinosaur is just about the size of a donkey. That's not that big. And even the massive ones were small when they were younger. So there's no reason why God didn't have dinosaurs in the attic. So if someone were to ask you, did God make dinosaurs? What do you think is the answer? Yes. yes. If someone just asked you, are dinosaurs in the Bible? Yes. Not the name. The name is it. But the creatures are. The description of it is. Were dinosaurs in the ark? Yes, they were. Smaller ones or younger ones. The ark was massive, though. There's a hymn that says this. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful. The Lord God made them all. I want you to remember, he made every animal that has ever existed. Right, will we do the Lord's Prayer together then? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats now. We're going to sing now from... Psalm 19, the Sing Psalms version of Psalm 19, you'll find that on page 22. Page 22, Psalm 19. This is a psalm that tells us how the creation, what all we see around us is testament to the fact that there is a God, to the testament of the greatness of God. The heavens above declare the glory of our God, and what his hands have made the skies proclaim abroad. Day after day they pour forth speech, and night by night their knowledge teach. Psalm 19, we're going to sing verses 1 to 8 to God's praise. We'll stand to sing. Bye. 
We're going to read God's Word now. We're continuing our series in Genesis, and we're in Genesis 1 again today. And I'm going to read the whole passage again. I know Andrew read it last week, but um, we always see new things when we read through Scripture again. So let's read the whole of the chapter. Genesis chapter 1, reading from the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered water she called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them, and let the lights in the expanse of the sky And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth, across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, And let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creatures that move along the ground. And wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds. The livestock according to their kinds. And all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. 
So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Amen. This is the word of God, and we trust and pray that he'll follow it uh, with his blessing. Let's bow our heads once more in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for a day of rest that you have given us. You, the God who made us, knew that we, we weren't equipped, we're not fit to work seven days a week. And so we thank you for a day of rest. We thank you for this day, Lord, a day when we can come aside and take time off from all the things that fill our week, and a time when we can reflect on all that you have done. So we pray, Lord, that you would bless this day to us. We pray, Lord, that as we think about your work of creating this world, that we would stand in awe of your marvelous work and that we would worship you. We think of our world today and we think particularly of those areas, Lord, where there's been disasters. We want to pray, Lord, for Turkey and Syria. Uh, we, we, we can't really... Lord, grasp the enormity of 28,000 or more people who have lost their lives. Lord, we, we pray for that situation today. We pray for those caught up in it. We pray, Lord, for those who've lost family members, for those who've lost everything, homes, livelihoods, who've lost hope, Lord. We pray that you would draw near and that you would help them. We pray for those, Lord, with nowhere to stay, caught in the cold. We pray for those who are fearful, who are distressed. Lord, all the variety of emotions that they must be going through. We pray that you would help, Lord, those involved in the rescue effort and those involved in bringing food and clothing and, and shelter to those who do not have these things. Lord, we commit that to you. And while we may be at a distance from it, Lord, we can pray and we can give what we're able to help, Lord, that work that's going on there. Lord, we pray closer to home for those who are struggling, for those who grieve. We think of the family of Wilmer Ferguson, Lord, and we commit them to you. We pray that you would uphold them, Lord, and many others, Lord, in our own congregation who are adjusting to a completely new situation, Lord, after losing one who was loved by them. We pray, Lord, that you would graciously uphold and sustain and comfort, Lord, those in need of comfort today. We remember the sick as well, those in hospital. We commit them to you, Lord, and we give thanks for our doctors and our nurses and all involved, Lord, in caring for others. We ask that you would help them in the work that they carry out. We pray for the work of the congregation, Lord. We pray for our new church. We pray for the project team meeting on Tuesday evening, Lord. And we ask that you would help, that you would give guidance and lead them, Lord, as they take that forward. We pray for our youth fellowship that meets tonight, Lord. We pray for our teenagers. And Lord, we ask that you would be at work among them. We thank you, Lord, for those of them who know you, who are trusting you. And we pray that there will be others as well, Lord. We pray for your word as it goes out eh, up and down our land today and to the ends of the earth. And we think of a new ministry beginning today in uh, North Tolsta and Lewis. We pray for Reverend Donald McLeod inducted there on Friday. We ask that you would bless him, that you would bless the congregation, and that you would bless that community, Lord, as well. And we pray for our nation, Lord. It has so many needs. We Sometimes, Lord, we fear eh, for the direction it is going. But help us to remember that we can bring our, our fears to you and we can ask you, Lord, to bring about a change of direction. Lord, give wisdom to our leaders, we pray. Open their eyes, Lord, that they would see and see their need of you and that they would look to you and look to your word as they rule eh, over us as a nation. Bless us and we pray. Help us as we continue to sing your praise and to turn to your word. All these things we ask, Lord, we ask them in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 
Sing once more before we turn back to Genesis, this time from Psalm 102. Sing Psalm's version, it's on page 134. Page 134. Psalm 102 and at verse 19, or where it's marked as 20. It's the middle of verse 19, singing down to 25. From heaven he viewed the earth, observing all mankind, to hear the groans of those in prison cells confined, and to deliver from on high a multitude condemned to die. Psalm 102, middle of verse 19, down to verse 25. It's down to sing. Seeking God's help, can we turn back then in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 as we continue our study in Genesis 1 to 3. So today we're going to read chapter 1 and verse 3 and just take that as a text, but we'll be covering the whole of the chapter or most of the chapter again. Genesis 1 verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. a program on telly called Grand Designs. You've probably seen it. it follows people who come up with uh, ambitious plans for a house as they build that house and make it habitable. But there's almost always problems. Tradesmen don't turn up when they're meant to or something like that. And things don't get done in the right order. You know, it's never a good idea to... Um, Install the electrics before you've made a place wind and watertight. And the bigger the project, the more essential it is that you have a robust plan of action. And that's what we have here in Genesis chapter 1, as God creates our world. There is clear order and development. This is a, the grand designer at work. Let me show you what I mean, just, just briefly. Um, we're told in verse 2, for instance, that um, the earth was formless, it was empty, and it was dark. And God immediately begins to address these three issues. First of all, he makes, he makes light, and then he takes the formlessness and he gives it form. And then in days 1 to 3... He gives it form, 
And then in days four to six, he fills the emptiness. So he's addressing all these issues in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ordered manner. It's formless, he gives it form. It's empty, he fills it. It's dark, he makes it light. And as we'll see today, hopefully, there's even more structure to it. There's even more detail, detailed order and planning in it uh, than that. You see, the world we live in, friends, it did not come to be this perfectly ordered by chance. It's, it's not random in any sense of that world, word. We, 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 didn't, we didn't get all this by things gradually evolving. It is, it was meticulously planned and it was perfectly constructed by God the Creator. This world owes its existence to Him. But when God made it, He didn't then just leave it. He is still as involved today as He was right back in Genesis 1. There's three things we're told uh, about what God did in verse 3 that are still true of God today. I'm going to read verse 3, and I want you to to imagine that you're the preacher, and you're in your study, and you're looking for three headings for Sunday, okay, as I read through verse 3. You're the preacher. You need some structure to your sermon. You're looking for three headings. See if you can find them. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. Did you find yourself three points there? It would be interesting to see what points you found. But I think there's three obvious ones in there. God said, God saw, and God separated. They're all there in verse Three. Now, these are all past tense. They're talking about something God did back at the start. But I want us to understand that the God who did all of that still does all of that today. He's still doing all of these three things. So I want to just bring these three headings into the present tense. So where we, where we read, God said. Let's call our first point today, God speaks. Where we read that God saw. Let's call our second point, God sees. And where we read that he separates, we'll call our third point today, God, or he separated, we'll call it God separates. So God speaks, God sees, and God separates. So let's look at the first of these. God speaks. God speaks. You know, that is immediately reminding us that God is not some abstract force somewhere out there. God is a rational being who who thinks and who speaks. And the reason that you speak and I speak while the animals do not speak is because you and I are made in the image of God. That's why you speak and that's why you uh, are rational, a thinking creature, because you're made in the image of God. But unlike God, we speak and nothing much happens very often. You ever tried saying to your teenager, tidy your room? And you go in the next day and nothing's happened. You ever shouted through the house, can someone help me with this? And there's silence. We speak and very little, very little happens. God is the opposite. When God speaks, awesome events take place. So I want to look at some of these events. I want to look at what happens when God speaks as we run through this chapter. I'm just going to look at, the, very briefly, the six days of creation. So we're going to spend more time on this first point of God speaks than we will uh, on the other uh, two. So verse 1, Andrew looked at it last week, tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 tells us about these issues that need addressed. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And so, 
God begins in days one to three. We'll look, we'll look at the first half of the week and then we'll look at the second half of the week. Days one to three, God begins to give it shape. And he does that by speaking things into existence. You'll see the word God said, the words God said repeatedly throughout the chapter. If you've got the NIV, it's quite helpful because it, after every and God said, it indents the paragraph. So you've got it in, in verse 3, and God said, verse 6, and God said, verse 9, and God said, verse 11, is it, then God said, verse 14, and God said, verse 20, and God said, verse 24, and God said, verse 26, then God said. God spoke. That's all he did. God spoke. And, and this world and everything in it was brought into existence. That, friends, is the power and authority of our God. So let's look at some of the things that he spoke into existence. Day one, verse three. God said, let there be light. And there was light. The sense is this was immediate. Now, a lot of people have a struggle with this because they ask the question, well, how can you have light on day one when the sun was not created until day four? That's a good question. How can you have light without the sun? But it's a question that forgets who we're talking about, that forgets that we're talking about God. Because what does the Bible tell us about God? It tells us this, 1 John 1, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. You say, oh, I, I get that, okay, I have some vague picture of God being bright, God being light, but, but, but not enough light to, to, to light the whole world. Why not? The Bible tells us very clearly that he will light the whole of heaven. So twice in Revelation, the last two chapters in Revelation, it tells us there will be, there's no need of the sun in heaven because God is its light. Let me read you from Revelation 21. Talking about heaven. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light. And that's repeated twice. Revelation 21, Revelation 22. So let's first debunk that myth that you can't have light without the sun. We're talking about God here. Then moving into day two, verse six. Uh, there's a very simple, simple words to describe him making the sky. He separates us, the waters below from the waters above. And, and you read that and it's, it's, it's just very ordinary language. There's nothing dramatic about it. And yet you look at the sky and the sky is dramatic. It is Utterly stunning. I woke up one day this week, I think it was the day of the gale, and, and it was the sky was deep purple. It was utterly beautiful. Then go back last week or the week before, when everyone was posting these photos of the nacreous clouds, vivid colors, wonderful shapes. The sky that God made, it may be understated here. But what God made is exquisite in its beauty. Utterly stunning. Day three, God speaks and dry land appears, and then he speaks again, verse nine, and he speaks again, and that land produces vegetation. Look at verses 11 and 12. And God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. What abundance God provided. What abundance God created. He doesn't, he doesn't make anything basic. He makes things that are beautiful. And he makes them abundantly. All of these things that he made were, 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 were able to continue to germinate. They had its seed in itself. So God speaks then, and, and the heavens and the earth, they take shape in, in days one to three. What was formless now has form. 
And then when we go to days four to six, what was empty, he now begins to fill. But I want you to notice that it's, it's not just that there's two halves, but there's symmetry between the days in the two halves of the week. So on, on day one, he made light. And on day four, he made the bearers of light, the sun and the moon. And then on day two, he made the sky and the sea. And on day five, he made the birds and the fish. You see the symmetry. It's like there's a mirror in the middle. He forms something and then he fills it. And then on day three, he's made the dry land and the vegetation. And on day six, he makes the animals that live on the dry land and the human beings who will both feed on that vegetation. Humans were vegetarian when God made them. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. That doesn't mean vegetarianism is the way to go because he later gave them permission to eat animals. After the, after the flood, when they came out of the, of the ark, he said, you eat the animals as well. Maybe it's because in the ark, they had to eat animals. They were in there for a long time. Vegetation wasn't going to last all that time. I don't know why the change, but they were vegetarian when they were created first. But that, that's going off on a tangent. You're seeing the symmetry. He, 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 he forms something on one day, on day one, and then he fills it on, on, on day four, day two, day five, day three, day six. There is tremendous order in God's creation. No hint of randomness whatsoever. God speaks and it happens. His words have this mighty power and ability. I'm just going to draw your attention very quickly to a few things from day four to six. So the first is this, day four, the sun and the moon. They're not named. They're not named. Verse 14, if I can find it, I left my specs today. Verse 16 it is, God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. It's, it's, again, it's so understated. He made two big lights. You know, we, we used to call the big light the one in the middle of the room, you know, 60 watt bulb. God calls the sun a big light, the greater light. It's so understated and yet it's so marvelous what he has created. But you might be asking the question, why, why was it necessary to create the sun if we already had light? Okay, good question. Well, we have to remember that the sun does more than just contribute light. It does contribute light, but it contributes heat as well. And, and our plants and our vegetation, and we need heat to survive. But it also, the sun and the moon combined, they govern our times and our seasons. And, and that's actually told us that that's one of the reasons they were made. Verse 14, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. God had much greater purpose for the sun than simply to give us light. We didn't need the sun to give light. It does, but it does much more than that as well. And then, did you notice that throwaway line at the end of verse 16? He also made the stars. He also made the stars. Five words. Five words. And here are we. And we still can't get our heads around or measure the vastness of the stars in the universe. They are beyond number. And yet it's so simply stated, he also made the stars. You know, God, God didn't, he didn't skimp on anything. You're going to, let's move to day five. Look at the first thing we read of it in verse five. God said, let the water teem with living creatures. He 
extravagance of our God. He could have just put some fish in the sea, but instead he fills it. Let the waters teem. And then on day six, verse 24, he makes all kinds of animals, all the wild animals, all the livestock, all the things that creep on the ground. Everything. The Lord God made them all. And then he crowned all of that by making man and woman in his image. More on that next week, God willing. So what, what are we seeing? We see that God spoke. He just he spoke. And this world and all its wonderful variety was brought into existence. But he still speaks today. The same God with the same power and the same authority. He speaks to us in the Bible. This is what he speaks today. And he speaks to our heads and he speaks to our hearts. And sometimes he says, let there be light. And our heart is transformed. He speaks that into a person's experience. Let there be light. And, and the darkness of sin just disappears. And the penny drops and it all makes sense. And you are a new creation. God speaks. But we need to move on. More briefly, God sees. So just as there was the same repetition of that, God speaks, or God said, there is also a repetition of the words God saw. So verse 4. God saw the light. It was good. Verse 10, about the sky, it says, God saw that it was good. The vegetation on, on day 5, end of verse 12, God saw that it was good. Day, day 3, I should say. And that same, these same words, God saw, you'll have it in, in verse 18, verse 21, verse 25, verse 31. Just reinforcing this Lesson for us that God sees. God sees. If you want some homework, you can go and study and come back and tell me why it doesn't say that on day two. It doesn't say God saw that it was good on day two. I don't have the answer. I'm hoping one of you will come up with something for me. But that, again, that's an aside. But God, here's the point, God doesn't just see what is good. Everything he made here is good. But he sees what's not good as well. And you don't need to read very far into your Bible to find that. In Genesis 6, we have this. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, that every inclination of the thought of his heart was only evil all of the time. You know what that's saying to us? God sees what you think. Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart. He sees what you think. He sees what you say. He sees how you act. God sees everything. I don't know if, like me, when you were younger, if you ever misbehaved, your mum always found out. She just always found out. And, and maybe she said to you, like she said to me, do you know I've got eyes in the back of my head? And I was so young when that was said, I actually thought, I, went, I actually went to have a wee squinty next time I got a chance to see if there was anything there. But you know, God does. His eyes are everywhere, the Bible tells us. Let me read you Proverbs 15, verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. He doesn't miss a thing. And it's not just a casual glance he takes to see what you're up to. Psalm 11, verse 4. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. God studies you. He studies you. And just in case you've got any thoughts of trying to hide, God's already said, don't bother. Don't bother. Jeremiah 23, can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do not I fill the heavens and the earth. He is everywhere, and he sees everything. He sees everything about you, 
He sees everything about me. But you know what blows me away about that? That he would still want us. That he would still invite you and draw you to himself and say, I love you and I want to save you. Even though he sees it all, God sees. Let's move on to our final point. We looked at God. He speaks, God sees. Thirdly, God separates. So that phrase as well is there repeatedly. He separated. Verse 3, he separated light from darkness. Verse 7, he separated the waters under the sky from the waters above the sky. And although the actual word separates isn't there as often, the action is. So he separates the dry land from the sea. He separates day from night. He separates man from animals. He separates male from female. He separates one day from another. God is repeatedly making distinctions. He's repeatedly separating. Even among the animals, every species he made was distinct from the next. Now, evolutionists will tell us that that, that species evolve from other species. And yet, you've never found the fossils of these intermediate stages. You've never found them. Because it didn't happen. Species don't evolve into other species. There is evolving within species, what we call microevolution. That a species over time will evolve to its circumstances, so it's better suited to its circumstances. That even happens among, among human beings, that we become better suited to the environment where, where, where we've been for, for, for a long time. But one species does not evolve into a different species. God separates. He made these distinctions back in Genesis 1, and he still separates Today, he makes distinctions between those who are his and those who are not. The God who sees our hearts knows whether our hearts are devoted to him or devoted to something or someone else. And there is a day coming the Bible speaks about when he will make a final separation. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 25. He said this, he will separate the people one from another. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. That is a reference to believers on the right and unbelievers on the left. And he will say to one group, come, you who are blessed, come with me to glory. And he will say to another group, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This will be the final separation. I want you to remember this today. The God who creates is also the God who separates. He creates, but he also separates. But if you're trusting him today, there's, there's one more separation, but it's a good one. The Bible tells us that he will separate you from all that hurts, all that pains, all that troubles you. All of these things. The second last chapter of the Bible says this. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. A separation from all that is bad. And that is because this great creator, the grand designer who made everything that exists has prepared a place for his people in heaven that the Bible says is beyond your wildest imagination. It says this about it. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. You know, when you think about all the stunningly beautiful sights you've ever seen in your life, they're nothing, nothing compared to heaven. How much more glorious will it be? As we remember, we have an extravagant God, a 
God who speaks, the God who sees, and the God who separates. Well, praise God, there's one more. He is the God who saves. The God who saves. And today he can save you if you will just ask him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity of your word, the simplicity of it. And yet we know that it raises many questions. Help us, Lord, to be ready to discuss these questions with one another as we grapple with the marvel of who God is and what God has done. Be with us, Lord. Bless us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to finish a singing in Psalm 34. Sing Psalm's version. It's on page 41. Psalm 34 and at verse 15. Singing to the end of the psalm. The Lord's eyes are upon the just. He listens to their plea. The wicked he rejects and blots from earth their memory, and so on. Psalm 34 from verse 15 to the end. Let's stand to sing. May grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.